Hello, everyone. My name is Greg Ristopin. I'd like to welcome everyone today to this Olympus webinar titled Introduction to Guided Wave Inspection Theory and Technology. In addition to the Guided Wave in introduction, attendees will learn about the powerful benefits of this solution and its advantages and limitations for pipe inspection as a screening tool and part of an overall NDT program. Our presenter today is Nick Bublitz. Nick is a global product support specialist with Olympus and has been working with portable and automated systems for eight years. This informational webinar will last approximately one hour. If you have questions, please type them into the Q&A panel in the lower right portion of your screen. If we don't get to your questions, we will um, address them either personally either by email or phone after the event is over. Now, without further ado, I'd like to turn this presentation over to Nick Bublitz. Nick, take it away. Thanks, Greg. I want to uh, second uh, Greg's welcome to you all. I know at uh, certain parts of the world uh, it might be quite early in the morning, uh, so thank you first and foremost for, for joining us today. Uh, as Greg said, the, the goal of this uh, webinar is to give you a, a basic introduction to Guided Wave, uh, try to go through the technology uh, as well as some of the equipment. So we're scheduled for about an hour. Uh, we'll have time, hopefully, for a little bit of question and answer at the end. I'll try to answer all your questions, and if we don't get to them, we have uh, ways to, to answer them uh, after the presentation. So without further ado, we'll go ahead and get started. So basically, as we all know, uh, if we're involved with the NDT business, um, today's inspection challenges are becoming more and more focused on high productivity along with uh, high quality results. Um, as many of you know, if you have Olympus products or you're familiar with the company, uh, we have a very strong pipeline product offering. And about a year ago, we decided to offer a commercial guided wave system. It's Olympus's uh, first foray into uh, guided wave technology. Um, basically, it's a solution for corrosion and metal loss detection, um, basically focused on pipes. So what we're trying to do in these next slides uh, this morning is both the basis of guided wave theory, so you have a basic understanding of uh, how the technology works uh, from a theoretical perspective, as well as uh, what the actual equipment does, and go over the, the system itself, a typical inspection, and how it fits into a, uh, the efficiency of a corrosion management program. So look, uh, just very basic, if we want to do a very high level uh, review of what guided wave ultrasonics for pipeline inspection is used for, it's basically a system that's used to screen in-service pipes and pipelines over long distances. And we'll go over uh, a little bit more specifics uh, as we go along. Um, one of the big, huge benefits of guided wave inspection is we can actually inspect pipes with limited access. And there's a laundry list of different access restrictions um, that can be present in a pipeline, and we'll look at that. And basically, the, the overall result is we can very accurately pinpoint locations that require further inspection, which ends up saving a lot of time. And we'll look at the, the details of that. Uh, overall, if we implement a guided wave system along with other complementary NDT, we can provide significant reduction in operating cost. Um, if you look at guided wave ultrasonics, if you Google it or look it up, uh, read scholarly papers, you'll also see it referred to as LRUT, or long range ultrasonic testing. So here's our basic agenda today, and we have this uh, fed throughout the presentation so can we kind of see where we're at. We're going to look at the basic applications in industry that guided wave for pipe is usually used. Go over a very uh, simplistic uh, basic of the guided wave theory. Uh, go over a basic guided wave system, of course, focusing on the Olympus system, but uh, most systems have uh, the same basic qualities. We'll look at what an inspector that was using a guided wave system um, would typically do for a typical inspection sequence all the way from the setup to the, the pre-planning, uh, reviewing data, uh, and doing their reporting. We'll take a quick overview of uh, what standards codes uh, govern guided wave today. Uh, which ones are in works. Uh, try to take a global perspective on that as much as possible. And also look at uh, you know the typical training paths. Uh, if somebody was to buy a guided wave uh, system, what it would take um, to conform to the standards and codes and also be uh, efficient in operating it. And then we'll have a conclusion kind of reviewing some of the major points. So we'll look at some of the basic industries. This list is by no means uh, all-inclusive. Uh, anywhere there's pipelines, there's a potential. 
uh, or pipes in general. There's a potential to use guided waves, but these are some of the places we see guided wave systems used the most. Uh, refineries, uh, power generation plants, uh, pipes and piping and gas transportation stations. Onshore pipelines, offshore risers and other piping systems that are offshore. And then uh, you know transportation with uh, DOT piping. So look at some of the, the general applications we see the guided wave system used in. Uh, one of the main, obviously, being corrosion detection in both in-service pipes and pipelines. That can be uh, very basic above ground conventional pipe and also might be coated pipe. And we'll talk about those details in the slides coming up. Detection of corrosion at supports and pipe racks. As you can see in the illustration, it's uh, using not a freestanding pipe. We need to support that in some way. So we'll go over the details of how a uh, guided wave can be used in those in instances. Uh, inspection of through wall pipe. So if we have some type of uh, manufacturing facility, a refinery, uh, some type of business that has pipe that actually is somewhat encased in a wall, uh, we can look at how guided wave can help us uh, perform NDT even in the sections uh, that might be encased. Uh, corrosion detection in service pipes and pipelines, just a few more examples. Um, corrosion under insulation, um, very popular topic today in the NDT, NDT community. Everybody wants to know the, the best way to test for these type of things. Um, obviously, removal of insulation can be a tedious process, so we'll talk about how Guided Wave can help with uh, pinpointing the areas of concern. Inspection of buried pipe, so without having to dig up a uh, full trench for the total area of the pipe, uh, we'll talk about how a Guided Wave system can fit into those applications. Uh, vertical pipes, uh, pretty much the same thing. Um, we want to inspect from, say, the bottom of a vertical pipe. Uh, guided wave can be a very efficient way without uh, you know, putting scaffolding up to the total area uh, to inspect it 100%, how guided wave can pinpoint the areas that we should uh, look at first. And of course, road crossings. So the applications. Um, so basically with guided wave, you know, generally what we're trying to do is avoid unnecessary excavation, uh, removal of all the coating. Um, putting up uh, complex scaffolding to inspect 100%. And Guided Wave can help uh, avoid the unnecessary levels of these things um, if no flaws are detected. But in its base, it really is a, a screening tool. Uh, we'll see in the, further in the presentation uh, what data is output from a Guided Wave inspection um, and then the, the need to address those areas with other NDT. Of course, with Olympus products, so if they're a Take an ultrasonic perspective, anything from a corrosion gauge, thickness gauge, flaw detector, or you know, a more advanced phased array corrosion mapping approach. But typically what we do is pinpoint those areas. And if we want uh, hard concrete um, values of wall loss, we'd go back with some other complementary NDT. It could also be you know, uh, OD laser screening or something like this. So just a very brief overview of the applications industry, so we'll go ahead and uh, continue on to the basis of guided waves. So if you think about what we know about conventional ultrasonics, um, typically what we're dealing with with uh, you know a flaw detector, a thickness gauge, a uh, phase array system even, uh, we're doing a very localized inspection, I meaning the area that we need to inspect. If it was a pipe, we'd have to um, prepare the pipe over every area we wanted to inspect, put a sensor on it, either move it manually or some type of uh, automated, semi-automated system that would uh, help with uh, the movement of the probe. But all of our inspection is really in a localized inspection area, either directly under the sensor or, in the case of angle beam, um, maybe uh, near the sensor. Um, to do this with ultrasonics, because we normally need a couplant, uh, we need access to that localized area, we must remove completely 100% of the coverings. We must condition that pipe where the sensor is going to be placed for surface roughness. Uh, it can be a very tedious uh, type inspection. And what we're typically looking at there is using a corrosion gauge and doing very small point measurements or some type of mapping system, like uh, hydroform corrosion mapping or a conventional UT. Uh, corrosion mapping system where we're mapping the whole area. One of the big differences with guided waves or long-range ultrasonic testing is the ability to screen an entire pipe region. Um, so we will basically have a long inspection range uh, in comparison. Uh, 
So if we put a collar at a certain location on a pipe, we can actually do a very long inspection range of about 182 meters to 600 feet in uh, optimal conditions. And we'll discuss those conditions a little further as we go on. And this is actually um, in both directions. So you can see in the illustration there, we have probes placed. And we're able to actually go down a significant length of the pipe and get ultrasonic results back without having to necessarily treat, condition, remove coatings um, of all those areas. So we look at the base of the guided waves. Um, we typically operate in a frequency range of about 15 kilohertz to 85 kilohertz, so a lot different than what we might be used to uh, with our traditional flaw detectors or even phased array ultrasonics. Um, guided waves have been around for quite a while, uh, starting around the 1920s. Uh, in the NDT community, it's really been heavily used in about the 1990s, which seems like it's, uh, it's been a long time now, but as we know with new technology, and NDT, it takes a significant amount of time before um, certain techniques are recognized uh, and standardized and people really buy into them. So if you go do research on guided wave systems, you'll see there's many different types. Um, one of the key things we want to focus on here is our system is a piezoelectric sensor or probe system. Um, you'll see some other EMAT type guided wave systems out in the industry. Um, used in both research and now being applied in general NDT. Uh, so these are the same type of uh, general manufacturing practice that you would think of with your conventional flaw detectors as far as the, the type of the sensor. Uh, we might be utilizing them slightly different in different wave modes, but uh, they're basically the same manufacturing quality. And if you do that subsequent research, you'll want to hit on to make sure you're looking at uh, the same apples to apples uh, when talking about guided waves. One of the main confusing things for people is, with an NDT background and an ultrasonic background is people are very used to longitudinal waves, uh, shear waves, uh, common practice uh, in our NDT training. Um, guided wave typically uses uh, different waves that we might not be familiar with. Um, the main wave we use in a, in a first scan acquisition is what's called a torsional wave. And we basically pulse this all around the pipe circumference to get 100% coverage down the length of the inspection zone. Now, without going into a very scientific, uh, descriptive uh, explanation of what a torsional wave is, if you can imagine having a coiled spring and pulling that spring on the ends and then releasing it, this is the type of uh, propagation, uh, a simple explanation of how that energy would uh, actually be osculating. Uh, throughout the pipe medium. Uh, our typical first scan, we call it an axis symmetric. Um, so basically, uh, it's a full 360 degree round. We're basically sending sound wrapping around the pipe and throughout the pipe body. And this is how we get the ability to, to do long distance screening um, with this type of wave. Uh, one unique thing about it, um, conventional ultrasonics is very directional. We know if we take a shear wave sensor, we put it on a shoe, we're looking in the forward direction. Um, without complex, maybe dual matrix phased array probes. We don't really look in many different directions, typically with ultrasonics. Uh, guided wave systems, typically, whether you look at the data or not, are pulsing uh, from both sides of the collar, meaning uh, if we look at our schematic or our picture uh, on the bottom here, the operator has placed a collar. When he actually shoots that uh, guided wave shot, we're actually going to have energy going in both directions. So it's a kind of a unique thing with guided waves. Um, it can be useful in an inspection sequence, or sometimes people will cut down their display or plan their shots that uh, they look only in the forward direction. But it's going to happen in a typical guided wave system. As far as inspection distance, uh, again, from the probe collar zero, uh, it's about 91 meters, 300 feet under optimum conditions. So that's going to shoot both ways again uh, for a total of about 182 meters or 600 feet for a total inspection zone. So you can see how this can be much more advantageous than having to put uh, a sensor 100% uh, down 600 feet of, of pipe. We're able to screen that pipe and decide where we go for complementary NDT. One key point is these are, you know, potential distances. Um, this really varies uh, the pipe, excuse me, condition, uh, what coating might be on it, the type of coating, how thick it is. Uh, the configuration of the pipe, whether it's a straight line pipe, whether there's uh, bends, elbows, uh, this type of thing. Um, so we can really only give one specification. It's hard to uh, 
estimate under certain conditions without uh, doing a little bit more quantification of how far that distance would be under any given condition. So I'm going to look at the, a little bit more of the basics and just see how guided wave typically outputs um, the results to us. Um, we don't get an accurate measurement of wall thickness like we would with a thickness gauge. You know, a thickness gauge, we put a couple it on, we go to a very defined area, and it spits out uh, two, three decimal points of uh, measurement, and we're able to quantify the wall loss uh, very accurately. Uh, the nature of being a guided wave is basically just uh, a detected general change in the total pipe cross-sectional area. So, for example, we can see two pipes of X diameter here, X thickness, and basically each one has a amount of wall loss shown here that would equal 5% cross-sectional area. To a guided wave system, these two different types of wall loss would generally look about the same. Um, obviously, the specifics are going to play into that, but uh, we're not going to get a measurement like 0.01 thousandths loss at 20 feet down the pipe. Um, we're going to get a general uh, classification or estima estima estimation of the, the amount of wall loss, and we'll look at how that, that works into everything uh, as we go on. Um, one unique thing that is equally sensitive to OD and ID corrosion. A uh, system won't generally tell you whether it's on the OD or ID, and that's why we would have to go to that area. If it was a covered pipe, we'd then excavate at that point, uh, visually look um, for OD corrosion, uh, apply other complementary NDT techniques to, to figure out whether it's OD, ID, uh, and get a quantitative measurement. Um, but we can estimate the circumvential extent, so once we know the location, uh, we also have several tools in the software that will tell us the clock position, if you will, um, of where that corrosion is generally located. So if we had a large area um, with covering, we would know that we want to remove 12 inches of um, coating or insulation right at that area. You know, we do it at 3 o'clock versus doing the whole pipe um, if that's where the, the tools have pinpointed the, the corrosion area exists. And again, as we've said all along, um, we generally, if we want that three decimal, two decimal measurement um, to get a, a final decision on how severe that corroded area is, we would use other NDT methods to, to validate the indications we find on a guided wave system. So what are the advantages? If it doesn't give us this value, why would we want to use a guided wave system? Uh, typically, we're looking for a high productivity inspection. Um, as we mentioned, the long ring coverage uh, and very rapid screening. So if, again, we had that 600 feet of pipe, we wanted to pinpoint the areas that might have potential corrosion um, without taking all the insulation off, without completely excavating it from the ground, without building 100% scaffolding to be able to access the top of it. Uh, if we wanted to screen through the wall and say, well, this part of pipe that is stuck in the building uh, might have corrosion here, uh, we'd be able to do that without investing in all that uh, upfront removal, scaffolding, et cetera. Um, so it does give us that 100% screening here in 60 degrees around the pipe circumference. And again, to be able to limit, ability to scan those pipes with limited access, such as coated, insulated, buried, road crossings, and through wall pipes uh, to get a, a general idea of where the corrosion exists. Which usually ends up, when we put this into a maintenance program or general use, is a very good cost reduction for for all those things, not having to do them 100% um, all the time. So it really becomes a cost-effective solution for pipe integrity management programs. And in the case of in-service inspection, um, we can get a good screening of the pipe, know where to focus our NET inspection without uh, disrupting the production. So it's just a very general basics of the guided wave system, the theory and how it works. Again, we didn't go into two scientific principles on several things, but uh, some of them will be supported uh, as we go further into the presentation. So we'll go over just a general system overview at this time. Uh, again, these will apply to most guided wave uh, inspection systems. In general, we'll, of course, use our Olympus ultrawave system as the basis, so there'll be some specifics, but uh, try to be pretty general. Uh, as we talk about it. So here's a real small snapshot of, of what the basic parts of a typical piezoelectric guide-away system consist of. 
Uh, in this case, we have an ultra-wave LRT or long-range um, box that actually does the, the inspection. We can see in the middle there. Um, basically, we can portable, it's a fairly small size. You can see it in comparison to the, the handheld laptop there. So it's a very portable thing we can actually put in a backpack so it's uh, easy to get around uh, the job site. That's easy coupled with an acquisition computer. In this case, we have a touchscreen uh, convertible tablet uh, recognized for the field, which will actually hose our software. There's no actual screen on the UltraWave. It's all done from uh, this acquisition and analysis software on a laptop. Um, then we have a collar, including the probes. So in this case, we can just get a snapshot of the probes. If you see my red dot here, uh, we basically have the probes aligned here, all our cabling coming out back to the guided wave system. Uh, and then we have basically a bladder system that is put over top of the probes. This will actually be coupled to the pipe uh, using air, either a uh, air pump, uh, electric or battery operated, or even a simple foot pump, depending on the collar, uh, be to a certain PSI to ensure constant pressure, uh, good results from the sensors. And we'll look at that in a little more detail as we go. But this is the, the basic parts of a guided wave system. So we have an acquisition unit, uh, a computer of some type that's holding the uh, setup, acquisition, analysis, and reporting software. And then we have our probe set. Uh, the bladders and the collars in order to accommodate different pipe diameters. A little bit further into um, some of the individual pieces, so we look a little deeper at the inspection collar. Uh, again, we see it on a different pipe here and also laid out flat. So this, in this case, is a very flexible collar. Uh, we usually sell a guided wave system in predefined kits. So our standard kit would be a 2-inch to 24-inch OD uh, pipe inspection system, which would provide all of the different bands, uh, sufficient amount of probes, wiring, uh, everything needed to go up to a 24-inch. Uh, outside of that scope, uh, we're able to produce uh, bands that are larger. That possibility comes up. Um, we also have kits that are a smaller range uh, for people that might only do smaller diameter pipes. But we're going to be able to have all the, the, the transducers and all the tools necessary uh, to do a certain range, typically. Um, each individual collar will also have a bladder. It's not shown real well here, but we actually have a slightly more rigid um, band underneath that actually holds the probes. And then basically that would be put on the pipe, um, secured by simple Velcro usually. And then we put the bladder over top. We inflate to a certain PSI, and this is what pushes the probes down. Uh, to make sure there's good contact between the pipe surface and the probe. Um, unlike most ultrasonics many of us might be familiar with, uh, because we're operating um, at uh, the 15 to 85 kilohertz frequency in the way the rest of the, the system works, we do not require coupling. Uh, so there's no need to spray water, uh, use gel coupling, or some of the things we might uh, be used to with uh, traditional ultrasonics. Uh, one of the key features of the ultrawave system is this band is actually a very low profile design. We can see um, the thing there. There's not a huge rise. The actual probes are very uh, short in stature, only about an inch um, from the bottom to the top. You can actually see the two ultrasonic sensors built into the probe here. A very small contact surface, so when we inflate that bladder, uh, we're ensuring very good contact. And we're, if we had limited restriction because of another pipe over top, um, some other access region. Uh, it's very easy to get this band. It's very flexible into as many areas as possible in order to facilitate uh, inspection in that area. Uh, everything is really designed uh, in order to be fast and easy to set up on the pipe. Again, uh, position the collar with some considerations, inflate the bladder, and we're basically ready to go on a pipe. Uh, we will have to do, in good practice, uh, maybe some conditioning. We don't want the pipe to be very rough, scaly, uh, et cetera. Uh, the area that the probes are actually going to be touching, which is pretty small, we'd want to do a minimum amount of conditioning that we'd be used to in traditional ultrasonic inspections just to make sure we're making good contact where we're putting the sound into the pipe. 
Uh, and then the idea behind our system is we really try to make it uh, light and compact. Um, again, backpack for the for the units, and these bands are very flexible. They're able to be folded up, put into a thing. So if we have uh, multiple bands, we need to go out and do a job. Uh, they're relatively lightweight, able to be folded, put into uh, Pelican cases, uh, et cetera. So a little bit uh, deeper detail on the, the laptop and a typical acquisition unit. Um, so we can see here. Uh, this is a battery-operated unit, so we can bring it to places where uh, portability is a necessity. You can open this bay door, there's slots for two, two batteries. Uh, we have uh, probe connections that go to the, the collar itself, the individual sensors, which are coupled into a single wire uh, coming back into the, the acquisition unit. Simple power buttons, some indicator lights, uh, and a connection to the computer. So the general uh, necessities of an acquisition unit itself uh, are not that uh, cumbersome or that complicated because most of this work is done by the software unit. Just our pulser receiver uh, type hardware is housed inside the actual, actual acquisition unit. Again, that's a 16 channel, uh, very broadband frequency range from 15 to 85 kilohertz. Uh, typically the laptop, we can run it on multiple laptops. We, with our system, like any system, we do recommend uh, the recommended one based on specifications. Uh, and also uh, durability for field. Uh, in that case, we use a GTAC V200 rugged industrial laptop where we can close all the ports in case we're in a dirty area. Uh, very sunlight readable display, integrated camera for reporting purposes, these kind of things. So the basic features are all in the, the computer that we would try to sell with the system uh, to ensure you have everything in the field uh, and compatibility with uh, the software requirements. So a little bit uh, deeper look at the software. Um, uh, guided wave systems made by other manufacturers will vary a little bit. Um, some of them will have a lot of uh, similarizations as far as uh, how the actual acquisition analysis is performed, but we'll use uh, the ultrawave software as a, as a guide here. Like many Olympus products, we try to make the setup easy. So one of the key features we think we have is a, a, a setup guide, or as we often refer to them in our products, a wizard. So basically, from the time you open to, to perform your first acquisition, it's kind of guided through uh, the different steps instead of having to go through many menus. Uh, so we can see a little snapshot of that, and we'll have a, a better look at that in the next slide. Uh, but basically, we're in the setup pane right now where we're just starting to set up for an inspection. And we actually have what we call a tree going on on the left. Now, this is just like any Windows program where if you open multiple files, you see the other um, files inside that folder, we're able to, to basically link down, close down, sh uh, open these up, shut them down. Uh, if you can navigate a Windows type tree, uh, we have basically everything we've performed or access to different parts of the software through that tree uh, as we build and get more complex into the software. So we basically go in there and we'll, we'll talk about uh, more on the setup wizard as we go. Uh, one of the key features we have too is actually how we display our data, and this is uh, very key and be able to sort through a large amount of data. We looked at the other slides. We obviously are uh, pulsing many different probes at the same time, many different frequencies. Um, looking at one A scan at a time uh, wouldn't be very efficient. So the software has to be able to lay out that information in a time efficient manner in order to uh, be able to analyze it efficiently. Uh, we'll talk more about focusing modes. Um, so we have two different focusing modes uh, with our guided wave system, uh, one called active and one called synthetic. And we'll go into those uh, in a little more detail when we get to those slides. Uh, and then obviously uh, system software can be very good, but in the end what you have to provide your client or your, your own personnel in-house is some type of report. So we'll look at uh, that as well how the ultrawave software tries to make that as easy as possible uh, and able to be used with the uh, other programs we might use for our reporting. So now we'll look at that inspection sequence and stop um, and look at some of those things that we looked at the system overview in more detail uh, as far as how they fit into that inspection sequence. So this is a really uh, defined list of you know what typically somebody would go through uh, when they went out to do a guided wave inspection. So see, we see an operator here. He basically has the whole system uh, with him. So the unit's actually backpacked here in a portable um, type uh, 
position on a backpack. He's going out to his first shot. He's actually got the bands and collars pre-assembled for whatever diameter he's going to do. Um, and here he's got his laptop and any complimentary uh, tools, including the, the air pump uh, and everything else uh, that he might have to do. So typically, before we do any inspection, we'd want as much information about a pipe uh, as possible. This could be done uh, you know, quite a bit before the inspection if uh, information between the service provider and the client, um, they have uh, details about the pipe as far as how it was built, uh, et cetera, or they do a visual walk. Uh, but what we normally do is a pipe sketch, which we'll see in the next one, because when we get to the analysis point, what we'll want to know is where certain features are, things like welds, uh, visual supports, uh, if we can see any corrosion, if we walk parts of the, the pipe, depending if it's visible or not, uh, it'll probably note any areas of corrosion that he sees right off the bat and where their location is. So we typically have a long tape. Uh, we'll mark off, you know, there's a weld every 20 feet. These will be used for different parts of the inspection and be able to uh, help in the analysis feature. So we'll, we'll look at that in a little more detail. But the more information we know about the pipe, it makes the analysis uh, that much easier uh, and the inspection that much better. Uh, we'll look at collar installation uh, prior to the shot. Again, a little terminology, but we'll look at that, uh, what we call axisymmetric scan or that first scan that we usually do uh, to start the inspection. Um, then we're supposed to go into individual uh, color map and A-scan analysis, um, look for any areas that uh, look of interest, uh, potential defects, maybe do um, some different type of focusing, uh, active, uh, as well as synthetic. And we'll talk about the difference of those. You can see the synthetic is something that's done during post-processing. So they might do this in the field. It might be something, uh, once it gets back to a second level analyzer, they decide to do more, where active focus it needs to be done while the probe collar is on the pipe. So we'll look at those in a, a little more detail. And then uh, at some point, uh, defect confirmation, once we make some calls on, on what we see, again, using complementary NDT, could be as simple as uh, conventional UT or phased array. Um, maybe uh, if the results warranted, they might do a second acquisition if necessary. Uh, and then final analysis and reporting. So this is a very quick laundry list, but uh, we'll go into a little more detail as we go here. So this is just a really rough um, schematic of what a pipe sketch might look like. Uh, depending on the pipe, the conditions, what we're dealing with, obviously this is going to change a little bit. Uh, but normally what we do is we walk and we'd measure and we'd, we'd lay out all of the features that we know about the, the, the area that we're going to be inspecting in that shot. Um, typically for a large project, we're going to be doing a lot of different um, areas of pipe. They would have a plan uh, where these pipes should be positioned and what features are in the pipe might play into that. Um, we want to be, you know, certain distances away from a bend or a weld uh, where we position our zero for each uh, shot. So all this is typically laid out as much as possible. Things like uh, bends in the welds, um, connections, uh, welds, uh, if they saw some visual uh, corrosion, um, changing coatings. Uh, all this would be pre-planned as much as possible so that they can plan where to put the collar for each shot. And then as far as uh, when they get data back, they're going to use this information to, to help with the analysis as well. So it can be as simple as a drawing on a piece of paper, or it could be something uh, more complicated done in software, um, but uh, a rough sketch uh, to line up with the data. And then basically once we know where our zero points or our inspection uh, points are going to be, uh, we go to that area. And we typically do some type of surface conditioning. Um, it doesn't have to be abrupt, depending on where we're trying to place the collar. But we, just like conventional UT, we take a wire brush. Uh, if there's some scale or, or the uh, loose rust, uh, we just try to condition that pipe as well as possible or well as we want to in the area where the pipe is actually going to be. So it doesn't have to be a large area, a couple inches in order for the probes to make good contact. Uh, the more attention paid to this, obviously, it's a, it's a very good practice for any ultrasonics. Um, typically, also, before we place the band, we'd want to verify. If we think the pipe is a certain thickness, we'd normally take one or two, uh, maybe uh, four points around the, the area where the collar is going to be, and just uh, record that pipe thickness measure and make sure it is uh, what we think it is. Um, and typically, we're ready to, to place the, the collar itself. So we mark that out where the zero point is. 
Um, nitrogen, the software allows you to make the zero of the band several different things, so it's somewhat flexible. Uh, we're going to position the lower band with the probes on it. Uh, make sure it's uh, fairly secure. You can see where it overlaps here, where we've made the connection on the, uh, the flexible inner uh, probe holder. We position a band, an inflatable band around it, or what we call a bladder. Um, we have a port not shown in this picture, but using a battery-operated air gun or even a foot pump that we would use for like a bike tire. Uh, we're just going to inflate that to whatever PSI is required for whatever band that is. And that's going to just make sure through the whole shot that we have a very good constant uh, contact and uh, resultant uh, UT that's happening uh, in that area. So we can see the schematic that would be in our setup wizard basically uh, for this certain pipe diameter, we've actually taken the total number of probes, uh, which appears to be 32, and split that for the software's purpose and it two areas first, so these are all connected to one um, channel here on the instrument. The other half is connected on the other instrument, all going back from a single cable from these individual cables. And then we break that into what we call quadrants. So you can see there's four probes that are basically grouped together uh, eight times. So we basically group these in order to have the software be able to process them correctly uh, and later be able to do some, some focusing uh, effects later. Uh, another schematic here just showing typically uh, after we inflate that bladder, um, we want to do some level of a wiring and coupling validation. The reason for this is if we have 32 probes, we have you know 32 wires going into that, and then we have two wires coming back here, there's a lot of point sources where something could go wrong. It's not like a flaw detector where you have one wire. There's a lot of channels to, to check, and this has to be somewhat quickly, so we have some tools built in. We can actually see uh, the sensitivity and the response that's happening. So if there's something wrong, we can see if a, a module was out. Uh, we have uh, subsequent ways to isolate that channel, check that channel, and make a decision whether that probe should be replaced. Maybe we didn't make uh, good contact here, so we could go back and visually see on the bladder. Uh, did we have the right PSI? Did we condition the pipe? We want to make sure all that is done before we take the shot because obviously we don't want to waste time taking shots if we're not going to get good results back. So then we define the setup. So this is going back into that setup wizard idea. Um, so basically we, we put in what we know about the pipe. So the pipe material, um, you know, if it has a pipe size, so all the basic ANSI ASME uh, schedules are in there, the pipe schedule. Uh, along with the thickness. If it has any coding present, uh, we can put that in for uh, reporting purposes, for trackability purposes. Um, and then we basically have a schematic showing us, again, uh, the total number of modules, how many uh, modules or probes are in each channel uh, as we lay out the inspection just so we know exactly uh, what's going on. That's a step-by-step. -step. We'll just step through a few different screens uh, and be able to see at the same time, we have uh, different uh, dedicators in the top with, you know, telling us if we're connected to the instrument, what the status of the instrument to laptop connection is. So the first thing we're going to do is uh, take an asymmetric scan. Uh, again, this is our terminology for basically that full volume, uh, first shot down whatever inspected length that we want to do. And typically what we're going to do is we're going to have multiple frequencies. So it actually fire them in sequence uh, rather rapidly. Um, quick to mix the inspection quickly. Um, and then we basically get uh, a layout. So here, if we break this down a little bit, we can see our probe collar was here at zero. Uh, we basically shot in both directions. And we can actually change that on what we display, but it's going to go as far as the ultrasound will go in each direction. We also see a, a large area in the beginning, uh, about four foot in this case on each one. And basically, this is what we call our dead zone. We'll look at that in a little more detail on the next slide, I believe, so we won't go into it here. But this is typically our output of the first shot. And then we take it from there, and we'll dig deeper into the data. Um, we'll typically try to find areas uh, that are most sensitive to the indications we see. Uh, and then we're able to use a level of cursors to pinpoint areas and go to a, a raw data and do further analysis. Uh, so this is our layout here. We've taken the first shot. Again, uh, we have the probe collar position, a small area. Uh, typically around four feet, two foot. It depends on the, the shot itself, but you can determine it from uh, the data you get back. We call this a dead zone. 
Uh, this is basically an area that we want to be careful about examining. You can see there's a large amount of signal. This is from the actual pulsing of the system. So we have a large area where we have a lot of acoustic energy that happens. So we want to know uh, relatively what that's going to be. It's going to tell us where to place our collar uh, for different inspections to make sure we get as much coverage as possible. Um, but typically, we're not going to do any in-depth analysis in that area. If we saw something that was a huge concern in there, we might uh, take another shot from a different probe position just to, to verify that. Um, so we definitely do a huge amount of planning uh, to accompany that dead zone as we decide how many shots to take, where to position the collar. So we call it an F-scan color map, which is just frequency color map. So we can see on the end here it's 15 to 85. Uh, we don't necessarily have to shoot all the frequencies. Uh, in this case, we can choose that. We usually do a one kilohertz step, so we're actually shooting every frequency between 15 and 85, and it lays them out in a plan or strip view. Uh, but if we don't think we need them based on the inspection, we can cut that down. We can actually change the steps so we're not uh, doing a step of one kilohertz. Uh, it's all depending, but this is a full shot. And then we have the distance. So each direction in feet, in this case, it could be in meters, uh, is laid out, and we can adjust that. You'll also see an area that we say low power zone. Uh, it's another acoustic thing that happens um, at these certain frequencies in this shot. Basically, we have a certain amount of low power that exists. So if we had an indication that was overlapping that area, we know that in that area we might have a little bit less power than we would have at the other frequencies. So we'd want to uh, keep that in mind as we do our analysis. Uh, it's a very frequency-dependent detection. That's why having one kilohertz steps and a full broadband range is very uh, advantageous. So then we can go in further uh, with these cursors that will position a distance as well as a frequency and, and go further into the analysis using the other tools. Um, the way we do this is a little bit unique, but uh, we have to have a way to manage all that data. Now, what is the scan time? Um, it varies a little bit. Again, if you're doing all the kilohertz, um, how much distance you're asking it to go. Uh, but one to three minutes is typical. Uh, three minutes is a typical shot for uh, a lot of inspections if we're doing a full uh, full range uh, frequency. So it's pretty rapid um, considering how much it's uh, actually performing and pulsing. So when we go to that, once we've selected a certain area that looks of interest, um, here we have our dead zone. We're not too concerned about that. We actually have a weld indication, uh, flange, some things that we know. Uh, exist in the scan, but these things don't um, correspond to anything that we know of, and they look very suspect as defects. Uh, we can actually position those cursors and start doing further analysis down on individual A scans. Um, typically, the first thing we're going to do is lay out uh, what we know. Um, so if we did that pre-scan or pre-planning, we lay out at what distance the, the weld, the flanges, uh, everything exists. We can see that same dead zone that we're calling out here. Uh, and then we actually have a map of those features. So if we have bends, if we have known uh, welds, uh, we're going to lay all that out uh, so that as we do the analysis, we can correlate it to, to the defects versus weld geometry. Uh, you can also see there's a weld here, a weld here. We actually have a system of DAC, or distance amplitude correction, that's often used uh, to help defect uh, quantification. So if we have welds at certain distances, we can actually uh, predict um, the loss of uh, amplitude going through a weld, and we use that to build a DAC that will help us do the, the defect characterization and severity later. Um, so we can see here a few different defects and actually the ability for things that um, maybe don't get put into a defect category. We have uh, C-info and other things that we can put specific notes into about them. Uh, so once we find an area that we want to look at further, we talked a little bit about active focusing. So what active focusing is, is actually we'll leave the, the bladder where it is or move it to a different location, but this is actually repulsing the instrument. Uh, but what we do is we choose. So in the back one here, we say that uh, there's something at 10 foot we want to look at further. In order to improve the signal to noise ratio, uh, get a, a, a confidence that there's something actually there, we could say pulse and focus your energy right at that 10-foot area. Um, so we're able to do that. We actually you know, split it up. Um, algorithms and the, the software is able to pulse uh, in a way that focuses at a certain um, area on the pipe. And then we get uh, some other tools that allow us to, to um, confidently uh, pinpoint where that corrosion is around the pipe and the location and the severity of it. So we can see here a little bit of a module having the pipe split up into four main regions and pointing to a certain area. 
um, where the pipe is and then giving us some confidence factors based on uh, the send and receive energy that we get. Um, so again, the, the point there is we're able to, to pinpoint and uh, reliably prove up indications, improve the signal noise ratio and the confidence of uh, detection, uh, reduce the, the defect false alarm rates. This is something that has to be done actively while you're on the pipe. Uh, synthetic's a little bit different, so this is more of a software algorithm type thing. This can be done at any level in the inspection. Uh, it doesn't require actually pulsing the probes again. Uh, it could be done once the inspector brings it back. Maybe he didn't uh, see something somebody else does. We can do all levels of synthetic focusing. Um, so we can see here on the back, it's another different F-scan map or color map, if you will, where we've actually split uh, into modular channels. And we have a layout uh, at that frequency, um, 0 to, in this case, 41 feet. Uh, probably a weld indication here, but two uh, discrete indications here. So if we see something that we want to focus in on, we can use software to, to help us there. So it's basically a C-scan view of the unrolled pipe, uh, channels versus distance uh, at only one frequency. So we use the big map, decide which frequency to use, and then we can do these synthetic focusing at individual frequencies that see the indications the best. Um, these are very uh, phase velocity. They're, they're very specific. So we actually have another wave mode that we use to do this uh, without going into too much detail. It's called the flexural mode. This will help us do some of the focusing and uh, characterization using the synthetic. So it's a post-processing tool and displays the entire uh, inspected zone. Again, just to allude to, so then we go to that area, we go back, we do our full analysis. There's maybe two or three areas or whatever number it may be. We're going to usually go back to those areas, remove the coating, dig up that area, uh, get some scaffolding and go up to the 20-foot mark or whatever the case may be. And if we want a quantitative value of one thousandths so or we want to inspect a whole area that we saw a lot of corrosion in, we're going to use a, a mapping system or a point location and get a, a default value. So what is the sensitivity level? Uh, we talked about it a little bit, but uh, you know, if we take uh, it's very variable depending on what what we're inspecting. Um, on above ground conventional pipe, so keeping it pretty basic, if it's a pretty good condition pipe, um, basically we have a proven detection size. It's about three percent cross section area. Um, that could be better, uh, depending on the conditions. It might not be that gr uh, as good as three percent. So it's a real variable. Uh, depending on all the variables that go into an inspection. Uh, here we just talked about some of the things that will make it vary. Uh, if the pipe is buried, if it's coated, what it's coated with, how thick. Uh, and if there's a whole lot, huge amount of heavily corrosion, it's uh, you know completely corroded, uh, it's going to have an effect in uh, the total inspection area as well. So here we look at uh, some data. So this is a 8-inch diameter pipe, Schedule 40. Um, this particular indication corresponds to about 2.8% of the cross-sectional area. So our, pro, our collar was here. We shot. You'll notice here it looks like it's very noisy, um, pretty typical on the lower frequencies uh, for this to occur. Sometimes people don't use them, but uh, we like to keep it on there. But uh, this area here just does have some lower base level noise uh, that occurs at low frequencies just as an ultrasonic principle. Uh, here we have a, a weld probably. Uh, some other features, but really toned in on this one area where we see uh, an indication at both the high and the low, uh, and we're going to do some further analysis of it. But this particular indication is what it would look like, a uh, 2.8% cross-sectional area compared to the baseline noise and a very typical uh, inspection of the uh, view. So here's another example. So here, 8-inch diameter, Schedule 40, the same example. Um, so how we might be able to populate that. So we take uh, cross-sectional area calculation based on the inside-outside diameter, uh, as well as we can figure out you know, different sizes of indications that might be able to show up around that 3% uh, um, confidence factor. That is typical. So there's uh, just another schematic of that. So this is looking at a synthetic focusing we chose to hone in on. Uh, on that defect, say shoot at a certain frequency uh, at 18 feet, and this is going to give us uh, a more accurate and confidence of where that's uh, at the pipe, so about uh, 3 o'clock in this case. Uh, we'll go through the detail of this, but when we start reaching these other quadrants, uh, there's a better chance that, uh, that that's uh, 
pinpointing the location circumventionally around the pipe. Uh, very busy display just to see what an operator would typically look at. So we have the, the frequency color map on the top, several different features, pretty busy one. Uh, we have our probe collar position at zero here, a dead zone that would be uh, displayed, very close weld, different things that we've identified. Again, we'd have the schematic identifying those if we know where those welds are. Uh, then we have several different things here because this is a pipe supported uh, by some type of support. So we actually have pipe supports. Um, with corrosion, we have isolated corrosion, um, corrosion between the weld and the support. So here you can see why knowing as much information about the pipe uh, aids the analysis in determining what things are. One other thing to see is it looks very busy because there's many different colors going on here. Uh, these can be turned on and off. Um, these are different wave modes. We talked about the torsional, the flexural. We actually have a, a rebound. Uh, color that shows us uh, what direction. If it had come back from one end of the pipe and rebounded, it's going forward now. Uh, this can be turned off and turned on depending on what the operator wants to look at at any point. Certain conditions and certain features also give different indicators that they learn during the analysis training uh, to give them an idea of whether it's a geometry consideration or a ge corrosion or corrosion added geometry. Um, this is about as busy as it gets just because all those features are turned on. So here's a little bit more deeper analysis where we've laid out all those features on our pipe schematic and started to do a whole level of analysis. So we can see we have a whole bunch of defects. Um, we also have all those supports. We've noted the end of the pipe. We've had a few areas we've identified as uh, C-info where we wanted to put um, specific things specific to our application. So it looks uh, very busy. On uh, this particular slide, we're looking at uh, the reverse overlayer talking about that again, um, this red, uh, green, I'm sorry, green uh, overlay that we can turn on and off is basically helping us identify that this particular strong signal is actually a rebound from uh, the opposite side of the collar. So this is something that's, you know, this energy keeps going back and forth until it completely attenuates out. So we have to have tools that can help the operator identify those features and say this isn't a feature that's actually at 23 feet. It's a rebound from 23 feet behind the collar that we're seeing going back and forth. So reporting, once we have all that, what we've done in our system anyway is uh, it's a word format. So uh, everything that we've done throughout, all the active, all the synthetic, all the first asymmetric shots, anything we've done in the software can be turned on and off to show in the report. Uh, we can generate that built-in camera. We can actually take, if we saw visual corrosion or if we want to document our probe positions at each location. Uh, really just a lot of flexibility, but it's going to basically whatever you want to put in, a defect table, uh, individual uh, shots of the synthetic and active focusing uh, that we've performed at different areas. Um, just uh, very versatile, easy to, uh, to uh, configure report. Let's go through the standards, codes, and training really quick. Uh, we'll spend a lot of time on this because there's a pretty good list. Um, you know, some of the main ones, uh, ASTM does have a standard practice for guided wave testing uh, focused on steel pipe work using piezoelectric, which, again, is what our system is. Um, one thing we're waiting for and very eager for is ASME is publishing uh, Article 18, which is a guided wave testing method for basic piping. Uh, again, that's in progress. I don't have a date, but uh, should be... Uh, hopefully fairly soon. And you can see some of the other ones as we go into more international um, type ones, you know, ones focused on pipeline, plant piping, um, and not published yet, GIS, NDIS, general rules, um, and then the, the BS, ES uh, standards have some as well. Here we go a little bit further, um, BS, EN, these top two, so methodology and qualification certification requirements for BS and EN. Uh, C-SWIP has a document uh, that just details uh, training personnel. Uh, PCN document, so general specific requirements for qualification, and also PCN certification of guided wave testing personnel, so what somebody needs to, to go through to qualify to PCN. And then our ASNT, ANSI, um, and guided wave is included now as a technology in the SNT TC1A document, uh, giving recommended practice that can be written into guidelines. Uh, for qualification of personnel, how many hours uh, are required, et cetera. 
Um, as far as training goes from Olympus, uh, we really look at each situation. Uh, it depends on who the customer is. Uh, Olympus does, of course, offer training, uh, remote and on-site technical support, as well as consultation, depending on what's needed. Uh, basically, with the guided weight system, uh, the need of the customer needs to be assessed first, and then you develop a training path and training plan because uh, a lot of operators would, might be familiar with other guided weight systems. They know the theory. Uh, they know the basic operation. What they need is uh, instrument and software training only. Or it might be a customer that has no guided weight experience. So we just look at all those situations and see what the best plan, uh, which quantification standards they need to, to follow. Uh, and we just come up with a training plan. So it, it's very varied, but those are the two basic classifications we would look at. Uh, just to really going through, I know we're getting pretty close to our time. Uh, I'll go through a quick uh, resume overview. Um, so basically with a guided wave inspection, um, what is the, the key features or how do we use it? Again, if we want to really simplify it, it's a long-range screening tool uh, for pipe integrity assessment. Uh, to be applied and used to save uh, removal or excavation on buried, coated, supported, insulated pipes. Um, and then the idea is that we use guided waves to save time and money by pinpointing critical areas without uh, unnecessary removal, uh, scaffolding, uh, all those other things. Before we go to questions, I just want to share my desktop really quick. I know this is a lot of information to try to shove into one hour. So on our website, just to point you guys to further information and ways you can get more information from us, we will be posting this uh, post on our webinar section of the website. But you can see at our flaw detector products, we actually have a guided wave section here. Uh, an overview with a lot of uh, basic details that we went over, details about the hardware, the software, the individual specifications or spec sheet of the system. Uh, multimedia is quite good. There's a very good overview video that we've shot that goes through a typical guided wave inspection, uh, much like we've talked about today. Uh, and then obviously uh, brochures in different languages uh, that we can get you. And also access to get more info. So if you go, you can request a quote. It'll go to the, the required person for this. Uh, you can con contact an Olympus specialist. Um, and you can request a demo. Um, so if you are, would like somebody uh, in your region to come out uh, and demo the guided wave system, we can put you in contact with them. So it's a very good place to go to kind of fill in your uh, information gaps. Let's see if I can go back to the presentation here. Uh, we are at the end of our one hour. Uh, we have about two or three minutes, so I'm just going to look. If you give me a few minutes, I might go quiet here. I'm just going to see if I can take one or two questions from what you've given us. And the ones that weren't answered, we will be addressing them one way or another via email or some other way. OK, so there's a question. Uh, I think we covered it, but to make sure everybody's clear, uh, where is the collar place? Is that area of pipe coating required to be removed? Um, it depends on the inspection. Uh, typically, yes, we would uh, remove a small area of the coating. Again, there's a lot of variables when it comes to piping and the coatings and everything else. But typically, we would remove the small area, four or five inches, that the collar needs to be placed in order to have access directly to the pipe wall. That's really what we're trying to test for the most part. Let's see if I can find another one while we just have one or two more minutes. Uh, the question about plastic pipe. Um, can the pipe be uh, polyethylene uh, or maybe HDPE is what they're referring to? Uh, but typically, uh, it is quite possible. Um, right now, uh, we haven't done any in-depth tests within Olympus um, on polyethylene. Every type of pipe material, basically for the software to work, the focusing tools, um, distances, everything, um, there's a certain amount of algorithms. It's really the power of the software. We need to be able to predict uh, and do certain things. So different materials um, require software development, basically. So right now, we're not focusing on plastic or polyethylene pipe, but we know it's a huge part of the industry, and there's a growing number of plastic or high-density, low-density uh, polyethylene pipe going into the industry. So 
Uh, it's definitely somewhere the technology might go on our software side, but I can't give you uh, any more specific on that point right now. So that's really it. Um, I do appreciate the questions. It looks like we do have uh, some other good ones, so we will uh, definitely try to get to those. Um, any more questions? Again, besides where I pointed you, you can start at our website. And I just want to say thank you one more time for joining us today. And as always, it's, uh, it's a pleasure. On behalf of Olympus, I'd like to thank all the attendees for joining us. And thank you, Nick, for your expertise and participation in today's event. We hope this material presented was informative and useful. This webinar, along with the Q&A, will be archived on our website at www.olympus-ims.com. Everyone who registered for this event will receive a follow-up email with links to the archive presentation. That's going to do it for today. Thanks again for attending, and we'll see you again next time.